It is Wales and it is raining. Raining on the hedgerows, raining on the hills, raining on the rivers, raining on the kingfishers, raining on the grave. Of that most beloved of old Welsh poets, David Thackwell. David's grave, and yes, all his readers are on first name terms with him. His grave is marked by an ancient yew, likely to predate the abbey itself. They say that yews are loners amongst trees, but I prefer to call them soloists, <laughs> as Daphis was, solo, soloist poet and harpist. And I think I'm not alone in being a little under his spell. George Borrow on his walking tour through Wales knelt and kissed the root of his tree. When I get to his grave, I see people have left gifts and bones and candles lying around on bits of broken concrete, five tipped over jam jars, once held flowers. The flowers are gone, and muddy rainwater silts the glass. It is a very untidy grave, and therefore full of life. The drains on the chapel of rest are more tidily kept than the devil's grave. I like that. I think the church can keep its tidiness. But fire has burnt out the trunk of the yew, and yet the yew is still sprouting, greenly alive, the phoenix from the ashes. After the fire, one arch remains. It is actually about the size and shape of the harp. And I crawl through it to sit right inside, leaning back against the heart of the tree, all charcoal now. Tucked inside, the tree is hollow. The wind hardly reaches me, and I'm out of the rain. The U is an hour shelter for his visitors. It's a day dwelling. It's a hearth. And it seems to me that Davis would have loved people coming to sit by him and have a think. And I wondered how many people come here for a chat, for a spliff, for a kiss. And if I stayed long enough, maybe everything would happen here. An argument, a shag, a snooze, a joke, a day of sunshine. With five toes and the mysterious heel of a goat, Dallas left his footprints all over the literature and the woods of Mid Wales. He's thought to have died of the Black Death, but he's one of those ancient writers who never died. Montaigne, Omar Khayyam, Ovid, Virgil, and Dallas. Lascivious, mischievous, and hot blooded. Barging his way across more than six centuries, his glad eye catching a girl's glance in a pub, we hear him shout fuck as he bashes his shin in the dark on the way to her room, hitting his head on the table, knocking over a brass bowl, waking a whole infill of angry men who would suppress his urgings. Irrepressible as the cock of dawn, he writes elsewhere of his fantasy of seducing an abbess for no other reason than because it is May. <laughs> <laughs> now, you don't necessarily have to answer this, but how many men have sung a mock reproach to their own cock for the trouble it's caused them? <laughs> you are a trouser full of wantonness, a pod of lewdness. He wrote, lying is so vibrant you can still see his rueful smile. It is imperative that I become a hermit, <laughs> even as he was rubbing his acorn until it sprouted. <laughs> when the striking of a wretched clock woke him from an earthly dream, when a horrible rattle bag of pipes interrupted a shag, we see him bursting with wry frustration all over the page hundreds of years later. But by a kind of shamanism of the centuries, he seems to have sung himself into the month of May, his cherished month. He wrote many poems about it, and um, this May Day, myself and a friend of mine who's a harpist, are going to go and honour the dawn at May Day at his grave because it needs to be done. <laughs> he was a reveller, rooting for life with all his ruddy geniality, geniality gorging himself on it, eating it, sharing its vitality. The spring was his season, his reason, and his emblem, green and cocky, as the new leaves of May. He was radiant too, leaving the land of mid Wales shining with the light of his love for it, so that even now, here in the lovely, low-down, warm, and dirty earth, his words gleam 